uh, and share a few stories, um, and, and then invite two other speakers as well uh, during the course of this presentation. So what's after mindfulness, if you had to ask me? Uh, I would use this word, I would say kindfulness. Um, and kindfulness in the sense of uh, generosity, right? which is the first target, the sense of service to other people, selfless service. Uh, there was a story that really moved me when I first heard it of a previous Buddha, Buddha Kasava. Whenever these big philanthropists, even kings, would come to the Buddha and ask him, you know, and says, uh, I'd like to grow in generosity, I'd like to grow ultimately in Dharma, um, they, he would say, well, you should go to my chief philanthropy officer. His chief philanthropy officer was a potter, a humble potter who lived in a straw hut with his parents. His name was Chatikara. And so every time people would go to him and he would sit down and he would have these conversations. One day it turned out that the Buddha in his monastery, with all these monks, uh, and he was in need himself. It was raining, it was monsoon, and the rain was falling through uh, part of the ceiling. They said, we need some straw. Where do we go? He says, go to my chief philanthropy officer. So they went to Chatikara's hut. Chatikara wasn't home, but his parents were there, and so these monks, they didn't know the parents, parents didn't know uh, these monks that had come, and says, we have come from the Buddha, Buddha asked us to come and uh, request some straw from your, from your home. Now both the parents were blind. They couldn't see, and he says, I don't know if we have spare straw, but I, we understand that our hut is made of straw. So why don't you take some from our ceiling right here? And they must have known that this was something that was to happen. And so they actually took a little bit of the ceiling. And they go back. Chatakara comes home. He looks at his parents. He looks at this gaping hole in the hut. <coughs> and he asks his parents, what happened? He says, the Buddha sent his monks for some straw. And so we gave it. And Chantikara was so moved, it is said, that for two weeks he fell into this incredible state of samadhi. For two weeks he stayed in this very high state. Just by knowing that, you know, the Buddha doesn't have a shortage of straw. He doesn't have a shortage of people and benefactors. But he decided to send his monks to this humble home. Because this humble home was home not just to giving of stuff, but the art of giving. The art of kindness. And so if you ask me what I have learned through this process of service, through this process of growing in generosity, I would say three fundamental things. One is make offerings. Now offerings is very different than charity. Charity, we say, hey, I want to give. I have and you don't have. I feel sorry for you. I want to give. It's a little bit of sympathy. Maybe there's some benefit to it, but that's a really low bandwidth way of giving. How do you move from that sympathy to empathy to deep compassion? Rachel Naomi Ryman has a beautiful quote. She says, when you help, you see the world as broken. When you fix, rather sorry, when you help, you see the world as weak. When you fix, you see the world as broken. When you serve, you see the world as a co-creative whole. But offering takes it one step further. It says when you offer, you're actually the one benefiting. And so you're grateful, although you're giving, you're grateful, thank you, for the opportunity to give, for the opportunity to transform myself. And so that's a very fundamental idea, make offerings. Second idea is to receive offerings. My wife and I, and in the last three years, my mom as well, have been making offerings to the local monastery every week, every Thursday these days. We offer food to the monks, which has been a fantastic opportunity. But when you look deeply at this, and if you were to ask me, who benefits? Is it the monks that get food? Yeah, they do. But actually, it is us that's benefiting the most. The monks are making themselves available so that we, people like me and my wife, can grow in generosity. And through that generosity, we can transform ourselves. 
And so in that sense, to receive offerings and to be available for people to practice generosity is also a very profound part of this process. And then lastly, I've learned to trust karma. Trust in the self-organizing ways of the universe. You can frame it in so many different ways. But how do you just allow that trust? Trust in the emergence. And so we looked at this back in 1999. And we said, how do you operationalize this? These are these three ideas that make sense. Make offerings, be available to receive offerings, and trust in the self-organizing ways of the universe. We said, okay, that makes sense. How do you operationalize it? And so we had, in, back in 1999, in the height of like the Silicon Valley greed, we decided to uh, go out to a homeless shelter, and we said, how can we help? We help them build a website. We would end up building thousands of different websites. And those websites turned into so many different projects. Now it's a whole ecosystem that touches millions of people every month. It's called service space. But to know service space isn't to actually know the projects. To know service space is to really know its three core organizing principles. And what's interesting is that all three of those map very closely to these three practices. So make offerings. You can't make offerings if you're transactional. You can't make offerings if you want something in return, even if you're thinking of getting something in return. So we decided we're going to be all volunteer about it. Receive offerings. You can't receive offerings if you're going out and seeking, if you're insecure, because then you're not going to be available for generosity. You're not going to benefit the giver. As a, as a receiver. So we decided to do something radical. It's like no fundraising. Trust what's going to come your way. Think outside the financial capital box. Right? There are so many other forms of capital. Can we actually create some magic with alternate, non-financial forms of capital? So that was our experiment. And trust. And when you trust in karma, there's a lot of people who say, look, there's so much suffering in the world, we need to do something, we need to find our agency, we need to create this change. But most of those people who are very passionate in that good sort of a way too, you can say, end up burning out. Because it's not regenerative. When the weight of the world stands on your shoulders, it is heavy. And so for us, the third principle was do small acts. And because if we're in a web of consciousness that is so deeply interrelated, it is invariably, inevitably, going to create this ripple effect. And so these three principles, you can look at the opposite of all of this, and that's usually what was happening in the Silicon Valley, right? You have lots of staff, you raise lots of money, and you go out and try to change the world. And we said, well, we didn't have an idea of how we're going to change the world. Who knows how long we stand? We have nothing. And, you know, we're just doing it as a labor of love. And back then, people thought we were crazy. Well, some of them probably still think we're crazy, but we're still standing, you know, still around. Um, so, th th this has been, you know, the series of experiments that we've done with Service Space. Um, and if you ask me, well, what have you learned? You know, I think one of the big things that happens is usually when you go out and try to change the world, in a values-driven way, right, not with anger, with compassion in your heart, we usually start with an impact statement. This is what I want to change in the world. For that impact, you need projects. So you create project planning. Makes sense? This is how we usually do things. Then you say, I, to implement, I need to have people. So you hire staff. And then those staff, you know, may or may not experience some kind of inner transformation. Right? You'll have your HR groups, you'll have your company policies. Yeah, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Maybe there are better people at the end of the day, maybe not, but the core purpose is impact. Now, in the service-based way of doing things, this was the total opposite. What we decided to do is start with inner transformation. And when you give, when you make offerings, anywhere, anytime, even here, you go out and you do a small little act of kindness, invariably, it's going to create these affinities. And over time, that's naturally going to attract people, magnetize people. And those people, when they come together in such a wholesome way, do you think they're just going to sit around and look at each other? No, they're going to create projects. And what do you think those projects are going to do? They're going to create impact in the world. So this is a completely flip way of creating change in the world by leading with inner transformation. There's a beautiful quote. Uh, 
uh, and I, I, I think it was spotted at like a Zendo once. It says, chant the sutra with your ears. Talk the Dharma without the words. Isn't it St. Francis of Assisi? He says, preach always, use words only when necessary. We've actually not even found it necessary to talk all these years about this. You know, there's no religion. There's no, we don't use the Dharma word even. Just say compassion, kindness, love. And guess what? So many people are touched by it in so many different ways. And organically, by the propensity of nature, they're moved in this direction of the greater good in their own personal journeys. It's been a remarkable thing for me to just witness. Um, so if you were to ask me, after 20 years of service space, after so many different experiments that have gone in so many different directions, what have you learned? I would leave you with these four insights. And the first one is that the font is up. Um, <laughs> first one is, <laughs> this morning we reviewed it and everything. Uh, first one is everyone is good at something. We, we tend to look at the world with sort of a deficit mindset. This is what's lacking here. This is what, you know, this is what could be improved. This is a problem that could be suffering. But how do you start to look at things in an asset-based way? What are the different assets? And this is a very fundamentally, uh, this has been a very spiritual process. Uh, I, Einstein said, I guess there's some debate, but nonetheless, this is a great quote. Whoever said it is that everyone's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its whole life believing it's stupid. And this unfortunately is what we often do because we don't ask this question of what are other forms of wealth, non-financial forms of wealth. We have, you know, community attention, as you see. You know, attention used to be, like we used to be able to pay attention for 12 seconds, but we have made uh, some innovative progress in that direction, and we are actually now at eight seconds. <laughs> Fish used to be had the lowest of all species, and now it's human beings. You know, so I, you know, we we we're, you know, how do you start to think in terms of time capital, compassion capital, nature capital? What are the different currencies that allow these this kind of wealth to circulate in the world? Uh, so I think we have to hold these questions. Um, Reverend Hank Sher, who's here, whom you heard yesterday, he is a remarkable puppeteer, as you saw, he's also a great musician. He came out with a CD, but when he came out with a CD, he had an option. Can I accept other forms of wealth, non-financial forms of wealth? And he says, you know, let's do acts of kindness. And so he, this was his recipe for downloading the CD. You perform a priceless act of kindness, write and submit your reflections, and check your email for a link to download the album. I mean, of course, from a monk, what do you expect, right? That's what you would get. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's profound when you start to include people in this way. So many of you know that at, at even this conference, you know, usually when you go to an Eventbrite page, you say, we are soon to be so Mr. Clark um, and discover. But we decided to experiment. And this has been the first conference where we've done this. And I think we're now going to, we've actually built this portal called On Tickets. And so we said, we're going to accept other forms of wealth. You can do seven acts of kindness and offer kindness wealth. Tell us the stories. You can do creativity wealth, create a video for five minutes and share that video about what mindfulness means to you. You can offer silence wealth, do eight hours of meditation and write a reflection. And so many people did all this and, and community wealth, and volunteer. And throughout this, right, this, was, this is a young woman, this is one of one amongst you, a four-year-old who was with her mom at Trader Joe's, and she's, sit she's just sitting down at the checkout. And at the checkout, she befriends this woman to her left, an elderly woman. They don't know each other. She learns that this woman is reading a book. Why are you reading a book? I'm just waiting for my bus. She says, so where are you going? She's going about 10 minutes away. So this mom and her daughter decided to give them a ride home. It's a simple act of kindness, but you can imagine so much value, right? This is a quote that says, at a grocery store, my four-year-old saw an elderly woman waiting for a bus. Her home was 10 minutes away, so we dropped her home. And she says, my daughter's youthful presence brought a smile to her day, and we all gained a new friendship. We promised to visit and have lunch with her. 
at a future day. Well, these things have value. When you do seven of these acts of kindness versus financial capital, I mean, you can't really compare the two, but you know that both of them have value. So how do we learn to honor these other forms of value? We had some incredible people do artwork to brighten people's day. Uh, you know, feed grandpa his favorite food. Uh, Sage actually read a post on Facebook saying, hey, I, I love to clean, but I don't have these cleaning supplies. I can't afford it. Can anyone help? So Sage picked up a whole bunch of supplies, created a goodie bag of cleaning things, and dropped, her, dropped it off. Complete stranger. Uh, Elizabeth made these little gifts and, and went and offered to strangers. Now, if you start to do that, you see that there's so much profound value uh, to all of this that, we, that often doesn't get measured or, or considered even. Um, this is a UC Berkeley student. She says, I'm going to offer silence wealth. This is right here at the Eucalyptus Groves. For those of you that are local, uh, there's this beautiful grove on, on the campus. And she's sitting down. She decided to sit on, in that position on that tree for eight hours. And she writes. She says, after eight hours of meditation, I looked up at the towering trees. I saw the smooth and tender bark covering the tree trunks as rougher barks were shedding off. Every now and then, leaves fell. Branches were on the ground. Just like the trees, I also don't have a permanent identity. I am constantly changing. She wrote a very long essay. This is just an excerpt from it. And it's not like she's enlightened, of course, you know, <laughs> she says. She says, yet society keeps teaching me to define my identity and sell myself. Right? I struggle to adopt a no-self when I need to build a shiny new resume. Right? How do you juxtapose writing your resume with no-self, right? I mean, I think it's a fantastic question. Mm -hmm. We should have a panel on it next time. <laughs> um, it says the battle is ongoing. She's holding these questions. And what an incredible offering to say, I want to be in this community of people who are trying to reach our ground. And here is a space, Diana and Coleman, you'll get to see them later in the day. They said, yeah, we want to accept alternate forms of wealth. And Obama, we got Obama to say, agree to this, with his own stamp on it. And he said, we should remember that capital is not just financial, it's social, informational, experiential, spiritual, emotional, cultural. And actually, there's a million different forms of capital. We're missing them in the systems of today. And we're not able to solve problems like inequality. We're not able to solve problems like climate change. We're not able to solve or even understand problems of artificial intelligence. I think we'll need to innovate. And I think these values, which are so central to Buddhism, can offer uh, a lot. So the second uh, big insight is if the first one is that everyone can be good at something, everyone has a gift to offer. The second one is not only does everyone have a gift to offer, they actually want to give it. Everyone can be great. Here. Martin Luther King Jr. says, you know, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Everyone wants to serve, but we often don't have avenues to make that happen. So I want to invite one of our superstar volunteers, Melissa Stevens. I call her Miss Stevens because she's a uh, middle school teacher. She's a person with like just a big bright light around her, uh, and that light will also be around her. Um, and she's just a, you know, she's written her book. Uh, she's a hero for so many everyday folks. Uh, she's a person I'm delighted to call a friend. So give it up for Melissa Stevens. <laughs> not an enviable position, uh, but I will do my best here. <laughs> um, my name is Melissa Stevens, and I'm so honored and grateful.